Hi, so this is going to be actually introduction to the basics of cryptography is what we're going to do today. So um, what we're going to talk about is not just uh, cryptography and its modern uses, but really getting down into the basics and the origins for some of the algorithms that make up or help influence the cryptographic algorithms of today. Uh, the goal is to explain it in a uh, methodology and a mindset where it's easy for you to digest, um, not too complex. So if I summarize something or may not say it mathematically accurate or uh, something like that. Um, the goal is to kind of give a um, mindset about it and try to introduce and teach these initial algorithms. And we'll get into that and sort of letting you be able to do cryptography by hand even. Uh, it's not as scary as it sounds. Um, but first, my background. So. Um, my education is in number theory, field theory, and of course cryptography um, and statistics. While well, in high school, I did that at ASU. I then at ASU studied aerospace engineering with concentration in astronautics, so rocket scientists. Um, I got trained in cybersecurity on SCADA systems, uh, PLCs, and embedded control systems. Um, I'm a certified uh, exploit researcher and advanced pen tester. Um, I'm part of InfraGuard and all the rest of these magical groups on there. Um, and some of my projects I've done in the past is I, I mainly do consulting for large events and venues. So I've done uh, Arizona Cardinals. I was responsible for cybersecurity for the Arizona Board of Tourism, uh, the Super Bowl that was here in the Valley, uh, the Fiesta Bowl. Um, and then currently I work for a uh, publicly traded company in the financial sector. So yeah, fun things. Um, here, I wanted to share some fun things before we start. These are, I got to see the eclipse at 100% totality. Uh, so here are some pictures that were actually taken there uh, with my camera. It's surprising to see. Um, it's relevant because Bruce Schneider and some other guys from our crypto realm were all there. Um, there are buds. Um, the guy who made BitLocker was there and also the guy who made FileVault uh, for Apple. So we all got together, us crypto and security nerds, and went and saw the eclipse. So yeah, pretty. OK, cool. Now the actual presentation. So um, uh, some people might not know what encryption is used for. So here's like a hard refresher really quickly. Uh, encryption you use every day. It's in your wireless communications. It's in your hard drives, um, your internet connections, um, sometimes your email with PGP or with TLS connections. Um, and then also hashing every day with passwords and one-way kind of um, operations, which are not technically encryption, but um, lumped in that uh, sum of kind of that realm. Here is a um, examples of those. So at the top left, we have a PGP key. Um, at the uh, bottom left, we have the Kryptos sculpture, which is the, on the grounds of the CIA building in Langley. Uh, which we'll go into actually. Uh, you also have Enigma machine uh, there in the center. Um, at the top right, you have a Caesar cipher uh, on a scroll. And then middle right-ish, you have um, SafeNet. I think that's a SafeNet Luna I key, probably. It's a, it's a SafeNet um, key, basically, for a hardware security module. And then you have the modern hardware security module by Talus down below there. So we'll go into all those things and kind of the algorithms that help make this up. But um, what the goal kind of is is that uh, this CIA crypto sculpture, uh, what we're going to go into today is we're going to describe all the algorithms that are currently known and used by the sculpture. So by the end of today or tonight, hopefully you should be able to, if I was to give you the key, you would be able to by hand um, translate the CIA sculpture in Langley. Um, so there it is in its glory. Well, if it, there, it, it's, it's a great hook. It's easier said than done. So um, with all that and things like that, um, yeah, that's why it's really terrifying, as you kind of got alluded to. But that's why we're here. We're going to walk through it. We're going to be able to do this. Just bear with me. Um, so there are some things to know in cryptography. Um, some of these you may already know, but it's good to have a refresher so that when I say certain things, you know um, generally what I'm talking about um, and can don't um, 
it, it helps to so I can talk in cryptographic terms. So obviously, uh, we know what cryptography is. It's the practice of encryption and communication of secure messages. Uh, key is the uh, piece of information or parameter that determines the functional output of the encryption uh, cipher, so the function. Uh, key space is the set of all possible keys used to generate it. So um, if I have a key, all possible keys that could be put into the algorithm is going to be the key space. Uh, plain text or clear text is the unprotected data. So it's the data that is not protected by cryptographic means. And the cipher text is what is um, result of encryption. Um, it's basically the encrypted data. Uh, some people will say that the data is then ciphered, um, which we get, in, uh, we get into technicalities with ciphered is the text and not the algorithm that some people, but how we're going to describe it, it's going to be the algorithm, which is what I put in the terminology here. You have the algorithm, encryption, decryption, cipher I don't, is the algorithm itself. Um, we typically talk about Alice, Bob, and Eve, the eavesdropper, and then Mallory, the malicious person. And then brute force, uh, basically how you go through to find the key, manual operations, cipher suites, which are combinations of authentication, encryption, key exchange, and um, identity algorithms, uh, cryptographic systems, it's kind of self-explanatory, crypto analysis is trying to break it, and then steganography is concealing messages um, within files and images, which isn't really encryption, but um, is in that realm. Uh, something to note here is cipher is what well, a, a cipher is not necessarily a um, a uh, program here. It, an algorithm can be a mathematical algorithm or an operation that's not directly related to a computer code. So when I talk about an algorithm, typically in programming and in Linux, you guys are used to, hey, it's a piece of software that does an operation. But it doesn't always have to be. And in cryptography, it traditionally, uh, for the longest time, wasn't um, computer. Because cryptography came before computers. So um, basically, uh, the goal of cryptography is confidentiality. So what it originated from is I, in trying to protect information, and typically military information back then, and I want to make sure that this information cannot be read. Um, so we start off with uh, basically cipher suites are basically our substitution suites was our first kind of cipher. Um, and those are uh, specifically, you'll find it called the Caesar substitution ciphers. And what those are is basically replacing characters in plain text with another text. And we'll show you what that is here in a second. Um, transposition, which is basically rearranging according to a pattern. Um, and these sorts of things really started a long time ago in about 400 BC. Um, the Spartans are one of the oldest um, that use cryptography. They use uh, basically a substitution cipher to inc uh, basically encrypt military messages on a sheet of papyrus. Um, there's also the Greek government used the substitution ciphers a lot, which is why it's the Caesar substitution ciphers. Um, and then um, afterwards, we came into modern analysis as we got into World War II. Uh, with the Enigma machine and um, really where cryptography took off and started becoming more mainstream. So let's start showing you algorithms and teaching you how to do them. So this is a Caesar cipher. Um, and all you have to do to know what a Caesar cipher is, is all you have to do is think of shifting the letters by a certain set. Um, this is actually called uh, ROT3, if you know um, your cryptographic algorithms. And it's actually pretty simple. And that's why it's a bag algorithm. Uh, but it's good to teach you and show you that this doesn't have to be um, that hard. Um, so um, on this one, um, you can see, for example, I, I have the plain text down below in the cipher text. Uh, for the word security in ROT3, you get um, which is a pretty uh, great cipher text. But um, We'll go into how you attack that later on. Um, it seems pretty well. Um, this is typically what you'll see a fifth grader trying to do their teacher. Um, but it worked well back then. Um, now, um, for example, 
uh, what do you think would happen in a, and this is interactive, so what, what do you think would happen in like a ROT13 or a ROT26 if we're shifting the alphabet? Does anyone have a guess at all? If we shift the alphabet 13 times to the right, right. or 26, yeah. is there something special about that at all? Like yeah, 20, yeah, yeah, that, that's the, that's, that's why it's a bad algorithm also. Yeah, so ROT26, ROT um, basically um, ROT13 is splitting it half uh, through, and then ROT26 is just going around the loop of the alphabet again, um, which, hey, I can sell you ROT26 encryption all day long, and I'll be a happy guy, um, but that won't pass your audit. Uh, ROT won't pass your audit in general. So that's something unique, and this starts to expose the flaws about this type of encryption. Um, now there are uh, also rotation ciphers, um, which are basically the rotation ciphers are um, what we just talked about. They are the ROTs, they are the Caesar ciphers, where basically we are shifting the uh, subset uh, of characters a certain distance, um, where ROT, as I said, dash the number, where is the number of characters that you're shifting to substitute. Um, now, this is just breaking down the concept a little more. Uh, the algorithm or the cipher uh, itself, how you do it, is replace each symbol or basically the character with another character that is the X number of places to the left. Um, so basically in a ROT 23, uh, in Caesar's time, there's only 23 letters. So typically it's 23 letters to the right is, um, excuse me, how they did it and the key space is actually different. Um, you can calculate the key space bits if um, you know math at all. It's just the log of your key space divided by log two is the um, number of bits in the encryption for your key space for the rot um, in this case. Uh, so if we want to talk about typical like AES 256 bit encryption and things like that, that's how you'd find out how many bits are in your rot. Um, you can also play around with um, one of the things you can do is um, basically change up your key space in this type of realm. So um, if I don't have 26 letters in my key space and I have 23, um, it makes it a little bit better than um, normal because letters can be encrypted to other values, but also makes it harder to decrypt. Um, and we already talked about ROT26, every letter is encrypted with itself. And in ROT13, um, an encryption and a decryption um, Basically, they're one-to-one -one operations because it's halved. So um, an encryption can get the same value as, uh, if you take the same text and you pass it through the encryption function, it'll get the same uh, text back as if you pass it through the decryption function, um, which is kind of special. So it doesn't matter if you're decrypting or encrypting, you get the same text back for whatever you um, send it, which is nice to know. So that's the Caesar concepts. Um, if you have any questions at any time, you can just ask. But um, Now we'll go to substitution ciphers, which are basically the same exact thing. Uh, well, sort of. Basically, in this case, we have our alphabet, again, at the top. And then we have a randomized alphabet, or a key space in this um, sort of mindset. And what we're doing is, as we take the letters one at a time again, we're replacing it out. So for example, in this, S replaces the Q. Um, now, there are, in this case, it, it's more complicated than a, just a simple rotation um, because now it's not, you need to know this, uh, this uh, basically your uh, key, so to speak. You need to know, hey, this T through O, which is not in alphabetical order, in order to get the value back. But if you pay attention, there's actually uh, two problems with this table. Um, and I don't know if anyone can see them at all. But there, there are two problems which present an issue if you are to use this table as a cryptographic algorithm. Does anyone see it? Yeah. The same letter translates to the same uh, crypt, encrypted. Uh... Yeah, R and W both encrypt to X in this one. And then so there's one more issue. Let's do if something's missing. Lower <laughs> case. Yeah, it's missing a Z in this one. Yeah, so actually in classical cryptography, it's very common to emit a letter from the alphabet um, so that you have a smaller key space 
Um, so, um, for example, a 25-letter alphabet fits in a 5 by 5 matrix um, to be used for uh, certain types of ciphers called Playfair ciphers or the Polybus um, squares, um, which we don't get really into. But um, also I and J, you can merge uh, together. Um, and basically, there's no spaces or punctuations, as we said also. Uh, so it gets really weird. Um, but um, basically, if you want to know how many cryptographic keys there are, um, it's 26 factorial in this case, which is um, 88 bits exactly, or uh, 403 septillion um, combinations for if you were to do something like this, which we're already getting to the point of where by hand these cryptographic algorithms are starting to get hard for a human to process. So this is what we're showing is basically uh, cryptography doesn't have to be something that's only the computers. Now, if you want to do something that's secure, it, it really needs the computers. But the basic concepts we can apply and get towards there to do these modern algorithms. So one of the other ways I can attack this, other than um, what we already talked about, is frequency analysis. So uh, what frequency analysis is, is it's the analysis of uh, the frequency of letters used in text and suspected plain text. Um, most of classical ciphers are vulnerable. So what that means is if I was to use an older types of ciphers, I can use frequency analysis normally to figure out the key, um, which with a couple septillion combinations, you can actually very quickly get down the possible combinations. Uh, substitution ciphers are highly vulnerable uh, to this as well. And let me show you a diagram which will tell you more of what this is. So. Um, if you ever have watched Wheel of Fortune, um, you will know that there are certain letters that you should always pick if you want to win Wheel of Fortune. Um, if you don't, you're clearly not a good contestant for Wheel of Fortune. Uh, or maybe to them you would think so. But basically, in the English language, certain letters are used more than other letters, um, as we probably can figure out um, right now. Uh, so it's a better bet that if a certain letter is used more, you can start trying to cipher, decipher what the word is or what the letter is. Um, all sorts of languages have this problem. It's not exclusive to English. Um, it's just different frequency charts depending on the language, typically. Uh, so at least we're, I, I, we all know English, so I'm going to use English here. Um, but uh, I have charts for the different languages, just not in the presentation. Um, so if I want to, for example, if I'm decrypting text I suspect is uh, English and I want to apply uh, frequency analysis, I can start looking for uh, the popularity of certain letters. And that can start trying to divulge to me uh, what I think the key is. So if I start breaking down, like, hey, I'm pretty sure these are E's, these are I's, um, or I guess that these are E's and I's, at least I can start um, decreasing the size of the key space or the possible keys, uh, so to speak. Um, the most common letters are E, T, A, O, uh, I, N, and then it's S, H, R, D, L, U. Um, and it's like, there's a mnemonic to it, but I don't remember it. It's like Etenshudelu or something. There's a mnemonic. Um, um, Basically, two or three letter combinations also is called a diagram or a trigram. Um, and basically, you can have what are called n-grams, which are certain letter combinations are frequent in the English uh, language as well. So instead of just also looking at individual letters, you can look at them in groups. And I know that these groups of letters are um, basically highly um, close together. They're used more frequently together, as well as if I look at them also individualized, that these are the number of utilizations of this letter. Uh, it starts helping mathematically me breaking down the key space more. Um, that sounds like it's a lot to wrap your head around, but it's really cool. Now, let's look at what the strong letter, um, what strong encryption looks like to frequency analysis. And that's what it looks like. Actually, that's actually so. Yeah, uniform, basically. I know, right? So strong encryption and modern encryption, typically for a lot of algorithms, actually, uh, they do some tricks, which we'll talk about 
so that um, you actually can get more of a uniform letter frequency. I exaggerated this a little bit. It's not like... That's an optimal. I mean, this is optimal. I don't really want to like do a... a, a so it, it, basically it's going to change depending on the algorithms and the keys a little bit, but it, it starts approaching more uniform. Um, the goal is to basically have um, all alphabet characters equally presented in the ciphertext algorithm uh, to thwart these sorts of attacks. Um, there's no flat distribution as shown here. That's usually not the case, and it's highly suspicious if your cryptographic algorithm has a flat um, line for the letter frequency. Um, also, real ciphers, um, they, they look like more random data. Um, when we get into real um, modern encryption, we also are key space um, and available character set. doesn't have to be just the e English 26 letters. Uh, we actually use symbols and other sorts of um, characters as well to or encrypt as well. So um, that is something to note. But so we're going to start talking about um, more advanced encryption. Uh, so we're going to talk about the polyalphabetic substitution, uh, which is a substitution cipher made up of multiple alphabets. So we were using a single alphabet before. So the next step is, what if we use more than one alphabet at the same time? And that might blow your mind, and it might be really confusing. How are we going to do that? Um, but the next slide will show us, and it's going to be a doozy for me to show. But just bear with me till then. Um, so. Basically, um, in a polyalphabetic, um, the same plain text of like an E, for example, can be represented with different letters or different symbols depending on the order in which they are in the text that you want to encrypt. Um, basically, counting the overall characters uh, this way make it harder to reveal your, um, your frequency analysis. Um, um, because of the multiple alphabets. So it, it's really dependent on the key. So you can't really, because E is not always the same value when you encrypt, it's harder to figure out because you may be an A here, it may be a B here, it may be a Z here. Um, it's basically, we also have the Vernier polyalphabetic cipher, which is what we're really going to talk about. Um, that was, it, it's kind of like a subset of the idea. Uh, it was first described in Italy. Um, way back in 1553, so it's actually pretty old. Um, it's considered the indecipherable cipher um, until 1863. So that shows you kind of the strength of these algorithms that we're talking about, that it takes um, man hundreds of years to figure out how to get around these. Um, it was considered widely unbreakable till then. Um, it was really uh, invented, though, by Alberti, um, uh, Leonon and Bastali Alberti in 1467, um, but it was misattributed in the 19th century to Vernier, which is the French guy, um, who did a similar concept with more sophisticated ciphers. Um, it generally defeats frequency analysis and um, attempts to improve this cipher normally lead to developments of one-time pads, which we'll talk about too, which are Ugh. But, so now we get to look at this. So this is really scary, and you probably can't see it. So I'm going to walk you through it. Um, so at the very top, we have a standard alphabet A through Z. And then on the left-hand side, we have our substitution alphabets. So you can see I have substitution set A, substitution set B, and so on to Z. Um, then on the right-hand side, what I have is different sorts of um, alphabets depending on the substitution subset. So, for example, for the B one, this one's a really easy one. So what I all I did is I just started with the letter for the sub alphabet and then wrapped it around in this case. So the A alphabet starts with A, goes all the way to Z. B goes starts with B, wraps around back to A, and so on. Um, just to give you the basic concept here. So the idea, though, is that in this case, I have, a, I have my plain text or what I want to encrypt, and I want to say attack at dawn. Okay. 
and then I also have my keyword here, okay? And what the keyword does is it helps me decide which alphabet to use in this case. So my keyword's gonna be crypto, and as you can see here in the keyword, what we do is we just repeat the keyword when we run out of the keyword. So in this sort of uh, algorithm or cipher, uh, crypto is repeated for all the rest of the letters. They don't really, I didn't line it up well. I might have put too many because I was doing this quickly. But <laughs> um, you can see, for example, in this one, the plain text of A, what's happening when you do the encryption is you, you take the plain text of A, you look next at the keyword at that letter. So that letter is C. So what that tells me is I should use the uh, substitution set C to encrypt this letter A. So what I do then is I go, hey, for the standard alphabet for A, substitution set C, what's the value? And I get C because it's, it starts with C for substitution set C's value. Um, with T, um, we do the same thing where, hey, for T, for now it's R. We look at subset R. We go all the way where T is on subset R's um, subset alphabet, and we get a K. And you notice that there's the reason why I did this word also is because there are two T's. And you notice that the next T is also encrypted to a different value now because the Y is a different subset alphabet. So for subset alphabet Y, uh, we actually use the, uh, it encrypts to the value of R in this case. So as you can start to see, it doesn't matter what the letters necessarily are because if I look at the frequency, in this case, the letters aren't going to always encrypt the same. So it's going to jumble up my frequency algorithm uh, a lot more uh, to try to decide out what um, this means. And the keyword is actually, um, the more random the keyword, as you can try to start to see as well, um, the keyword can kind of influence your frequency um, analysis. Excuse me. So the more random the keyword, the less you're going to use the certain substitution uh, set alphabet. Um, you can see in this one, I'm, I mean, I'm going to use over and over and over the same alphabets all the time, um, which can kind of lead to attacks. Um, this is um, in classical cryptography. Um, Basically, also what we do is we convert this to mono case and remove spaces and arrange them in groups of five letters at a time also, which I don't think I did, but that's one thing that we typically do. Um, uh, and to summarize, uh, basically we take some subset alphabet and we take a value from the key. And we to get that subset alphabet, we take our normal standard alphabet and we'll, we'll we yield out a different value. So subset C, J goes to L, and so on. Any questions about this? Yeah. In practice, was it actually used with rotated substitution sets or were they more randomized? Um, well, typically, what you try to do is they try to do these with keys with like things like books and stuff like that, too. So it's not as random as you would think. So your key may actually be like a sentence or a paragraph out of a book. Um, it could be, because you have to think like in mod, like, Cryptography, the goal is to be in place, visible, and yet they can't find it. Um, and so random letters typically don't really flow well in uh, ancient times. So in classical cryptography, it's, it's not as random as we would hope is the short end of it all. Any other questions on this or anything? Cool, good, because you're going to, no, I'm kidding. I wasn't going to ask you. Uh, yeah, so um, let's talk about something else you can do, um, which are uh, transpos transposition or permutations, um, which are also route ciphers. Um, I, there are multiple algorithms in cryptography can have multiple names to them, which I may, and sorry if I use them interchangeably, um, just ask if you're confused. Um, but basically, um, this is another type of classical algorithm which can help defeat sort of frequency analysis. Um, what this is, is this is a route cipher. So um, basically, letters of a plain text are rearranged to produce a cipher text. So um, basically, to decipher, you have to re, um, re reverse basically the arrangement process. So um, the plain text of abort the mission, you've been spotted um, in a um, five by seven grid. Okay, so you can see I wrote Abort the mission, you've been spotted 
and I put x, x to fill in the rest of the grid. Um, if I, so, and this is where the route comes in. So the route defines out how I go to encrypt it. So my encrypted value on this one comes back as I go down each column. And that's my encrypted value to get back the, um, the letter, so to speak. Um, the keys you route. Um, and for example, I could also go a spiral clockwise through this. And uh, the spiral could be that text down below. So basically, um, badly chosen routes can lead to excessive chunks of plain text. Um, or simply have it just backwards in this case. Um, transposition is vulnerable. It, I mean, it, it's better to frequency analysis, but it's technically still vulnerable um, because the in this case, if you're not combining it with something else, the letter frequency is still there because we didn't get rid of anything in the, uni the English language, really. So no matter your route, you're really going to expose out the English language again. Um, it can be attacked by not using, traditionally you don't really use the single letter on, on route ciphers. You want to use biograms and anagrams. So basically the groups of letters work a lot better in route ciphers. Um, and you need to know then, uh, to decrypt it, you need to know first off the route. So how did I go about creating this? And then also the width and height of my grid. And then basically what I can do then is I start with a grid and I start uh, writing in the values back of the language until I get back my grid and then I can just read off my grid of the final information. So in this case, um, it, it, it's pretty cool because uh, with two pieces of information and then that the, your text is actually there in a letter without some massive key, I can make something look pretty well encrypted. And it's harder for people to solve if you're not like a computer. Now computers can, using these frequency analysis, smash this pretty quickly and find possible keys. But for a human, this looks like a pretty good one of the pretty good ciphers. Um, with, with the rotating, with the route. Yeah, yeah, with the routes. I can see a board backwards already. Yeah, by glancing. Yep, with the route ones by just glancing and things like that. Um, well, because you write the plain text, and then you, off of the plain text in the grid, you basically contact your route, and then you start with a blank grid when you're doing this, and you write it back down in order to get it. So it's, it, it, I mean, modern, actually, modern cryptography, like symmetric ciphers, actually use this sort of thing uh, with both the substitution uh, and the transpositions. So this is actually, even though it doesn't seem like it, this is one of the building blocks to modern cryptography right here. Um, this sort of route ciphers, uh, so to speak. Um, uh, yeah, I think I talked about all that. I gave another example in my um, notes here, but uh, I don't, it's not fun to write down. Because um, <laughs> I, I would have to diagram it. It's one of those things. But OK, cool. So um, XOR, OK? So let's talk about XORs a little bit. So what an XOR is, it's a binary sort of um, encryption al algorithm um, that is basically we convert the text to ones and zeros. And we only do an output if the, it's basically true only if the element together is true. Um, this seems simple and very easy, but there's an entire cryptographic um, cipher suite that uses this called one pad time pads or XORs. Um, which you'll hear all the time, which is bad. Um, but it's something we need to talk about. So uh, this is also known as a truth table um, of X or B. Um, so the X or um, is used in place of a cipher for the one-time pads. Um, we're mixing different entropy pools, uh, so random bits of data um, with non-data to try to get out an output. Um, so multiple sources in this, combining them together, we can get less and less random output. But it's harder to go back to input A, depending on this, um, because, uh, for example, um, um, it's hard to tell which input is which um, sometimes, depending on how it's done. So that is XOR. So one time pads, though. We can actually talk about these. So now we're in the 1900s. Um, so 1917, 
Um, it was one-time pads were created, and they were patented a bit later. Um, and it's the source of, uh, if the source of randomness is truly random, and I say truly random because this is all in mathematical theory, then in theory, a one-time pad would defeat a cryptographic analysis, okay? But it's really hard to get a random source of data. Also, um, it doesn't offer a lot more uh, security even with the truly random key um, because it kind of, it, it's hard to explain, but if you're looking back at this XOR, um, it's the difference between um, being able to encrypt something versus not able to decrypt something. So depending on my source and comparing the uh, OR operations uh, on a one-time pad, it can actually become hard to decrypt for even me with the key before knowing the universal, basically, the universe can burn out because you can have so many different um, combinations. Um, and basically, you can never decrypt it. Um, key can also never be used again, and it's supposed to be a one-time pad, so hence the word one time. Um, and the requirement for your key length makes it really hard for it to be used for anything else generally um, because you have to have a very, very large key length. Um, so the large key length plus the truly random data and the fact that reverse an operation takes a lot of computing power makes it a very bad generally thing. Um, so, yeah, it's one of those things, basically. <laughs> so, with that in mind, we're going to talk about something else, which is really fun. So we're going to talk about um, steganography, because what's cryptography without steganography? So um, remember with cryptography, the art of cryptography, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make a message um, in plain sight that can be uh, not, basically, if you had the message and you saw the message in plain sight, you're not going to be able to decrypt it. Um, so that my message can flow freely, you can read it, and you're not able to decrypt it. Steganography, though, is instead of the art of in messages in plain sight that you're trying to um, protect, these are messages that now you're concealing so that you can look at something else but then um, not know the message is there. Uh, so it's a little bit like counter to cryptography in a sense, and that's why we talk about it. Um, it's also kind of the exact opposite of what we did before. Um, and it's opposite of, I, oh, I didn't talk about, well, what we'll talk about next is Kirchhoff's principle, um, basically. Um, so in ancient Greece, um, they basically used to, uh, one of the things that was considered for steganography is uh, they used to tattoo words onto the backs of slaves' heads when they were shaved off. And then they'd wait for all the hair to grow in. And then, ta-da! You can't see the message. Uh, that has its flaws, obviously, because all you have to do is just wait for a, a bad hair day, and then they have to get all shaved off. Um, also, modern printers, you have things like invisible ink. You have with basically like the yellow dot patterns, which identify serial numbers and the um, who printed it. Yep, date, time, who printed it, where. Um, that you can deduce something from the paper. Um, to help identify it. So it, it is likely older in cryptography because we're just concealing messages instead. Um, you have invisible ink back then. Um, we talked about watermarks basically in modern days. But the cool thing is is that um, with security and privacy married together, uh, because it's more privacy realm than a security tool, um, we can make something really, really strong. So. Um, where it's maybe illegal to use a cryptography because cryptography is not legal in the whole entire world and there's also some issues with it and depending on the country and regulations you have to follow. Um, if you had chose to do that, um, there are ways to do that um, because not everyone in the world um, has the same sort of laws we do and sometimes they're living in situations where they may have to do that. Um, it's also for <laughs> Avoiding attentions of authorities, I had to put that in while we're inside here um, to do a little slight jab, uh, um, because basically your text is not visible 
um, and it's not drawing the attention, or uh, basically the attention of others. So if you are really doing things securely, you can take these principles of cryptography and principles of steganography, and really uh, what you should try to do is try to marry them together to produce a really secure system if you're trying to do an overarching loop system that cares about both uh, the basically the message um, security and the message privacy. So that's why I like to talk about it. But we're going to talk now about Kirchhoff's principle, which is really great. Um, so Kirchhoff's principle is something that we use when creating cryptographic systems. So not that you should create your own cryptographic system, but if you were to, this is the overarching principles that you should use when creating cryptographic system. So I'm, now you're going to start learning how to make those algorithms. Please don't use them. Um, so who Kirchhoff was is it's Auguste Kirchhoff. Uh, Dutch lingui uh, linguist, so I'm probably butchering his name. Uh, he is also a cryptographer um, and a professor of languages at a school in Paris uh, in the 19th century. Um, basically, this is the underlying principle when creating um, publicly available strong cryptographic systems. Um, so uh, public known algorithms um, are basically as we know, the modern algorithms were studying these for things like cryptographic weaknesses and flaws and new attacks that we can um, break. But these principles overall help you create a system that should, on principle, uh, be less likely to have that because these are what you need to think about at the basis. Um, so um, a direct translation of the underarching principle is, and there's a lot more of this text, so just took some of it. Um, a system may not require secrecy. It can be stolen by an enemy without causing trouble. Okay, And if we kind of paraphrase that, because this is 1883, and it, it, it just translates weirdly. Uh, a cryptographic system should be secure, even if everything in the system except the key is public knowledge. So what that means is that if I was to give you everything in the system but the key, the system should still be secure and have no way of you even, like if I gave you the plain text and a ciphered text, so the, uh, the in to the function and the out to the function, and I don't give you the key, it shouldn't be able to derive out or break it so you can have all keys, for example. So like let's take the Enigma machine, okay? So with the Enigma machine, um, we know that um, basically every day there was a weather report that went off. Um, and then we know that it said hail certain person at the end um, and had basically um, this frequency that we always knew what this was, frequency analysis. Um, we could start to deduce what um, all possible keys were and things by this system. Uh, so because it was vulnerable to frequency analysis and things of that nature, without knowing the keys, I can basically break the system. Um, it's technically because of the way you use the system, but it's just a poorly designed system, and it doesn't work well for this metaphor, but you all know it. So I'm going to use it. Um, so this is kind of in contrast to a common approach, though, that we all have, which is security through obscurity, um, where we depend on people not knowing things to, and not knowing how things work in order for it to be secure. So really what is better, though, is rather than going through security through obscurity, a truly secure system according to this principle. Um, also, uh, one of the things that we like to talk about plug with being open and everything, it really embraces. So if I had something even that is open source or that everyone's able to know and see as an algorithm, if you're able to see it all and I'm able to reveal everything to you, then you can know it's truly secure or it's a really good system, um, which takes also a stab at public companies a little bit, but eh. So um, that's Kirchhoff. Now, so we get to, actually this is a lot shorter than I thought it was going to. So we, um, so going back to this, okay. So what this was, again, this is the um, Kryptos uh, statue um, in CIA Langley headquarters. And now you actually have learned three of the four algorithms are used to cipher this. Um, the reason why you don't know all four is because the world hasn't um, determined what the last algorithm is yet. 
So um, basically, what this was is this was a, a statue created by a artist um, with also a, a cryptographer's help uh, for the CIA Langley that um, has a couple of messages in it. Um, so what the messages actually use is, um, I wrote it down. Where is it? It's the Caesar cipher, and then we also use the polyalphabetic cipher from memory. Let me make sure. Yeah, I have the text too, and like the text says, like for example, it says it was totally invisible. How that possible? The use of the Earth's magnetic field, information gathered and transmitted underground. Um, it goes on and on. It's probably kind of boring for you. I'd let you figure it out on your own. But um, so. To go back on track, um, what they did to use to decrypt this is um, the sorts of techniques that we talked about earlier. So we have things like frequency analysis um, and those types of things that really help with these algorithms a lot for those Caesar ciphers, for the first one that was ever found. Um, because we know that the Caesar, the substitution ciphers, those are pretty easy. Um, so I can, um, by hand, even pretty much figure out with frequency analysis what excuse me, different letters are used in different places. And then in um, the polyalphabetic or the Werner uh, ciphers, I can use, instead of just letters, I can use more anagrams and biograms or larger letter sets to do a bigger frequency analysis to figure those out. So that's really what wasn't all that was done because there's algorithm weaknesses too, but at a big overarching summary, those are two techniques I can use to figure out the key to that. Now, if you had the key, you could do the exact same thing we were doing before with the polyalphabetic, doing the substitution sets for the alphabets, doing it all by hand, or doing the Caesar ciphers in order to decrypt that. Uh, there's also uh, another one of these types of statues. There's one at a university. I don't remember the university off the top of my head, but it was actually a encrypted communications with, a, I think it was polyalphabetic again, the Vernier cipher for, um, it was just a, Russian diplomatic cable that they um, placed on a statue inside a university. Uh, so uh, fun, great advertising, and a great way to recruit um, college kids, um, of course. But um, that is one way they did it. And then um, obviously there's no known solution for the last part yet. Um, we don't know if the CIA or the NSA knows, but they won't tell. They could, you don't know. Uh, there were several clues given though about um, decrypting it. Like for example, they gave off um, a certain letters. Um, MZFPK is clock in the fourth um, panel, for example. Um, and it's believed to be the plain text for the Berlin clock. And um, they think it's a reference to the German Enigma machine um, and some World War II communications. But, um, you can go try to use what you learned to try to decrypt that. So um, I did this really quick, uh, but that is the presentation. So if I advance, yeah, that's my email. That's my PGP key because this is cryptography. Uh, and then what's meant to happen is uh, there's a second part, which hopefully we get to do. And that's where now using this knowledge, we get to go into the modern algorithms and apply those, these simple ones um, to modern algorithms. But I am welcome to go back through with our remaining time through any of the algorithms and go more in depth and explain them or do any of that exercises if you want. Or if you have any other questions, just ask me. So yeah, any questions or anything you want to hear or see? Or like what the weather report is? Yeah. Can you go to the, I think the third slide, I think it's wrong what you have written. When you have a rod three, there it is. So, E should point to B. He does point to B. So, security, the plain text in security. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, used, I didn't use ROT B. Yeah, ROT 3. Yep, I used a different ROT. Yep, thank you. <laughs> so, it's just wrong. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know what? That was on purpose, actually, to see if you were paying attention. Oh, come on now. <laughs> <laughs> well, what what ROT was it? I used that. You did minus 3 on the second letter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So if it's a minor streak and you argue that it's route 23 or something? 
Uh, it's rot. Modulo or something. I mean, you're going around, yeah. so yeah, it's not really the same. Um, yeah, thanks for catching You can that. see Y on the bottom, you know, points to B. Yep, yep, which is wrong. Because Y needs to point to uh, basically... Well, we don't have it, it's uh, a bit to the left of the A, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I should be able to do all this in my head, but it's like 8 at night. 3, you can do it on your head? Whoa. If you envision the key space and rotate in your head and then go down the alphabet, just let, listing off your alphabet, it takes a while to do it in your head, but it's much easier on paper. But yeah, I will fix the slide. Thank you for that. <laughs> I, I see you got the graphic from Wikimedia Commons. Yeah. It's, uh... Yeah. Well, it's from. No, the the diagram. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That diagram. Yeah, that's from Wikimedia Commons. Yeah, that's. I took. Uh, I have a. I have a uh, works cited page, I think, on this slide or somewhere of where I got all the images and everything from, but I didn't think it really matters. I have it if you want it, where I got the images from and everything, but <laughs> yes, these images I did not make for a lot of these because that takes a long time. Also, I'm not good at making GIFs, so, and cryptography can be really dull. <laughs> so, any other questions or comments or. Um, Easter eggs in my slides that you found. <laughs> anything? Do, is there anyone who wants anything else you want to do? OK, cool. Well, thank you. Um, with that. <laughs>